Let's start to see, great to see people coming in, recognize some people here. Got Rourke from Logical Position. What's up, Rourke? Sarah Jane, how's it going? Cool to see uh, David Das. David Das, good to see you. Uh, as, as folks come in, I uh, would love to just hear where is everybody Where's everybody based out of? It's always a fun thing to know. It's just like write your city in the chat. Where is everybody coming from? Scottsdale. <laughs> nice. Argentina. Amazing. Good to see. Good to see you all. All right, we're just gonna wait. Hey, Pamela, good to see you as well. I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes to uh, for everybody to join in. But while we wait, um, just in terms of format, so we're we're kicking off something new. Evan, if you want to share your screen, we can we can have the uh, the banner of the workshop up for this. So we wanted to try something new. We want so Evan has been uh, has been working with a lot of teams. I'll give a bit more of a background, but. We wanted to start these workshop sessions um, to bring a larger audience into some of the things that we've been thinking a lot about, talking a lot about. And our hope is that this is the first of uh, many that we'll do. And so we'd love to hear from everybody that joins today what you liked about it, what you didn't like, what you'd like to see more of, less of, because this is definitely something that we want to expand on uh, and, uh, and do more of. Um, Evan, you got the screen share? Are you good with that? I will be in a second. I'm running into technical okay, difficulties okay. here, but resonated. Today feels like a good day, doesn't it? Like just overall. It does. It does. It does. It does. No, uh, I mean, until you said no technical issues, I was happy. That was, so many times I've had these, and it's just like it's brutal. Where it's a bunch of people coming, and if there's something that right. goes wrong, it's always so stressful. But uh, hopefully, so far, I, so good. I promise you, today will not be that day in this community. <laughs> Oh man. Cool. Uh, sharing now. Cool. So welcome everybody. Uh, welcome everybody to the first session of our Sprints with Evan workshop series that I'm very excited about. So full disclosure, I've been pushing Evan for this for a long time. I've been trying to convince him to, to kick this off for a while because Evan's got some real gems on a lot of the work that he's doing day to day. And I'm I'm very excited to bring a lot of his kind of expertise and ideas uh, to a larger set of people. And so excited to be kicking this off for a little bit of background. Um, so we started working on Motion, the product, uh, about a year and a half ago. Prior to that, uh, we just spent a lot of time talking to some of the best teams in the space, the brands, um, agencies, marketing teams, creative teams. We just spent a lot of time talking to them and understanding what what biggest people's like biggest priorities were, what some of the biggest pain points were, and so we've we've spent a lot of time trying to understand problems and pain points. And some of that we've been trying to solve through a product, obviously with motion. But a lot of it really just is about decision making, strategy, process, thinking, workflow that that spans way further than what an actual like software product can do. And a lot of the opportunity that we've been seeing is just like bringing more and more people together and talking about some of these issues. So, so what are they? Here's, here's how we think about it. And hopefully this resonates with a lot of you. And this is the sort of thing that we want to jam on quite a bit in the uh, weeks and months and years to come, hopefully. But basic idea is that over the last few years, creative has obviously become more and more important for a number of reasons with more and more Facebook consolidation, with the rise of just like so much more competition in feeds with the, 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 the more challenge it is to get somebody's attention because every consumer is so bombarded with things that uh, it really does take a lot to capture somebody's attention. I've heard the term attention economy thrown around recently and I think is a really nice way to describe it. And so for a lot of these macro factors, creative is starting to become really, really high priority for a lot of teams. Obviously it's, it's always been important, but I think everybody in the space recognizes that there's something that's been happening over the last couple of years that has, has been making this even more of a high priority topic. And so, okay, so that's 
that's that from a priority standpoint. And to address it, now teams have a bunch of different challenges. One of those challenges are the fact that you have the creative team on this side and the marketing team, the media buying team, the performance team, whatever you want to call it on that side. And historically, it's very challenging for these two teams to work together because the creative team is very visual. They, they work in design. They, they work very visually, whereas the performance team is very numbers driven, data driven, analytical. And this kind of like left brain, right brain challenge makes it so that these two teams, if left to their own devices, they kind of they, they silo themselves up and they work very, very independently. But I think what modern teams are realizing is that that needs to be broken down. You need to somehow bring these teams together. And so how do you do that? And a lot of a lot of that is about workflow and creating a process where you're able to bring these two teams together. And uh, and so Evan talks a lot about this as uh, as the one who onboards a lot of folks into motion and works with the teams to try to implement this sort of process. Um, and a lot of it can be centered around if you want to think about it as a creative sprint process. And there's a lot to talk about when it comes to creative sprints. And that's where we're hoping to center a lot of these workshops around the different aspects of creative sprints. So today, Evan's going to kick us off with an overview of the topic, diving into some of the fundamentals, and hopefully uh, in, in future sessions that we do, we'll, we'll go a little bit deeper. But uh, with that, Evan, I'll hand it over to you. You can kick us off. And just also, in terms of format, one thing I want to note is that we're, we want this to be as, as uh as um, interactive as possible, obviously. So if, if Evan is presenting, you'll see that I'm just gonna interrupt him a bunch of times to get him to expand on something. If there's something that you like comes to your mind, uh, type it in the chat. We will have some some time in the end to just do like pure Q&A, but if if something comes to you, just like type it and uh, and when we'll get Evan to, uh, we'll just kind of talk about it as, you, as it comes to mind. So feel free to shoot anything that uh, that comes over and I'll have my eyes on the on the chat as well. But uh, Evan, you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Thanks right, for the intro, start. Reza. Really, really appreciate it. And ultimately, everybody here, I know your time is very valuable. So I really appreciate you taking the time. It means a lot. I think the very first thing that I'm excited about is like kicking off this process, like Reza had mentioned, just in terms of um, being able to dive into the workflow of how creative can truly make the impact that we needed to. Uh, and I'm also excited to see my name on a slide. Like that feels kind of cool. So uh, this should be a good process. In terms of my background and why I'm talking to this about you all, Reza talked, to, talked a little bit about how I'm helping teams specifically on motion and diving into creative strategy on what that can look like. And I know a lot of you are here today. So it's exciting to see you again. But I think the other side of things is I come from a media buying background myself. So just in terms of running ads across different channels, across prospecting and retargeting, that's what I do as well. So I feel like, especially for my, my media buying nerds here, um, I, can, I can resonate with you on that end. And then for the creative side of things, I'm getting more and more close to, to speaking with everybody like yourselves. So that's the intro there. When we dive into creative sprints a little bit, I think the very first thing is just to like set the stage of like, what the heck is a creative sprint? Why are we talking about this? Why is it a hot button topic that people have motion specifically care about? And I think where I can first start is like the topic of performance creative, right? I think when I say that, it's something here that everybody inherently understands. Everybody knows that it means, okay, in my ads, I'm running some creative. But ultimately, when we're talking about like the definition of true performance creative, I like to think of it as very much as a, as a creative asset, whether it be image, video, carousel, GIF, that list go, goes on. That's ultimately developed to entice a specific action, usually a buy or a lead generation, right? Um, and usually in digital advertising. And I think a lot of people on this call who, who are here to learn can really attest to like performance and performance creative being rooted in data. But I don't know if that follow through to data is always there. Sorry to call anybody out where it's just not making sense. But I think what I've seen the most is that data analysis is rooted in a gut feel. So it becomes like, yep, I looked at the thing. Uh, this was good. And let's just run with it. And that's the stuff where people kind of resonate down. So it means like this audience, audience resonates with this hook. So do more of that. This look and feel is doing, uh, doing well. Let's do more of that. And that's the type of analysis I've seen. So I think the biggest thing now that we set the stage in terms of why do we need a creative sprint process? I really think about it as just like, um, I think we all need structure in our lives. And this is something that really helps with that, right? So 
Reza had mentioned it a little bit, but data passes from so many different team members. And we'll talk about those different roles in a second here. And then those data relationships of how they should actually interact with each other are very important. And then the biggest piece is just what are next steps, right? So without structure, I think that's the best way to look at it. What do we miss? And there's three specific things. So without structure, I tend to see that number one, it's a lot of shooting from the hip in terms of leading people to scramble, what we're doing week over week. But what we really need to do is empower people to take action and to understand the impact of their work. The second bucket, and I think the best way I can say it is like analysis paralysis. I think everyone on the call can attest to the hardest thing being starting. So how do we avoid analysis paralysis? We make it easier to understand what the first step may be. And that's where Creative Sprints jumps in. And then the third bucket, which I ultimately think is the worst part that like not many people talk about, it's just once we actually run that test with the specific creatives we've developed, it feels great. We make some more money. And then with 50% of our brains, because we're all occupied by so many other things, we look at it and say it went well, and then it, it just appears into the abyss. What we should really look to do is like memorialize that learning. So we're in a spot when we're onboarding new team members, if we're onboarding an agency or whatever it may be, we're able to then bring people up to speed on exactly what's happened to the account. So it's just a lot easier. So that's the high level spiel, just in terms of what we're thinking about from a creative sprint process. Now let's get into the most important thing at the heart of everything really, which is the people side of things, right? So when we're talking about the people, we have three major groups here, but let's not kid ourselves, right? Like it can really apply across the board. Reza, I know you're gonna have a lot of questions here, but the very first thing that I wanted to say is that although this looks siloed in terms of paid social management and like creative team or creative strategy side, the way that we like to think about this at Motion is like a hat system, right? Because I think there's a lot of people on this call where every single one of these buck buckets falls into your job at the end of the day, right? So it's like sometimes on the paid social end, you have to think about what to do next based on the data you have right now. Sometimes on the creative end, if you're not getting what you need from the paid social side, you need to be able to dive into the data and say like, hey, I'm gonna make this thing for you so we can make some more money. So don't worry about these individual silos. I like to really reinforce that the hat system is probably what matters the most here. So that's the high level introduction. When we're talking about each of these individual roles, Reza, did you want to kick us off? Because you had started out a little bit talking about some of these roles, or I can jump into it. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I've, I've been really fascinated about this piece. Um, so I, I, I think a lot about just like org structure, teams, and how do teams operate. And it's really interesting seeing how, you know, from very, very small teams where you just have like a couple people on board to larger teams that might have, you know, a couple hundred people on board, what does it look like and can we learn something from the world where you do have a really large team and you have a budget to kind of separate things out where people are, are truly taking ownership of, of full areas and and so i think a really interesting thing to think about is on the lower end of things let's say you're a very small team and you just have two people by necessity people are wearing multiple hats so the media buyer might be doing some creative strategy work the creative person might be doing some creative strategy work or data analysis work. And I think actually that's really uh, useful and valuable. So I think one of my questions for you, Evan, is when you think about when you think about when the team is very small and out of necessity to have to wear many hats, there's some pros and cons to that. The pro is that like, you know, you have somebody who sort of hand, have their hands in every in every in every pie and there's some value to that because there, there isn't the silo right it's kind of contained in a single person but there's some disadvantage in that in the sense that that person isn't necessarily able to do every single role perfectly and so they're you know they're, they're just being practical and doing the best they can and as you grow to be a larger team now you have the opposite problem you have okay you have people who can specialize and i'm just really going to own the media buying channel i'm really going to own creative or creative strategy even and then on the one hand, that's useful because you have people highly focused in certain areas, but then you have an issue of what you mentioned around like being siloed. Uh, so how, how do you think about that for teams that are either you know, small and just getting started out or teams that are actually a lot bigger? What do you see as the challenges with each and some kind of just opportunities for what to do in each of those cases? 
Most definitely. Yeah, that's a great question, Reza. I think ultimately starting with the small team side of things, this is where it's fun, right? Because here at Motion, we're also a growing team and there's a lot of things that we need to tackle. And to be a little bit morbid, I think like the only thing that is forever fleeting is time. So finding enough time to do everything you need can be challenging. But what I'm hoping for, for anybody in this room who does hold, I run the ads. I also tell the creatives or freelancers what they need to do. And I manage all of our budgets. For anybody in the room who's in that bucket, ultimately what you want to focus on are the easiest things that you can do and the easiest wins. And I'm going to have some examples throughout this presentation where it's not necessarily about like creating a new asset every single time and saying like, listen, I need five new creatives every week. That's probably too challenging and too costly, right? So how do we be smarter about it and say like, listen, I have this one asset. Can I extend the life of this for however many weeks or months that I need it? to live and make those changes rooted in data. So that's what I can say to the smaller teams, to the larger teams in the room, this is where it starts to get really fun. Just because at that stage, the way that I like to think about it is like, what are the benefits if somebody is wearing a creative hat, if you were able to tap into the management or paid social side of things? And that's the same for all of these other roles. So pay, paid social wise, like what happens if you had some of that, those creative elements, right? So when I think of each of these different silos, I like to focus on the benefits that ultimately come with being empowered by data to make performance creative decisions. So for example, on the paid social side, when you're running ads, your ultimate goal is to make money, right? But ultimately you have a number of people that you need to give this information to. If you're working for an agency, you have your client and then you have your internal managers. If you're working at an in-house brand, you have, your, um, you have your management team and your creative team. And that list can kind of stem. Right. So what, how, not even what, it's just like, how much easier would it be if the information that you're providing to those different parties can be simplified and to be able to say like, okay, well, uh, from a creative standpoint, what do we need to do immediately from an iterative perspective and then a net new concept wise. And then if I jump over to the creative team side, I think a big thing there is just like creatives have been left in the, and, and, and sorry if I'm misspoken for anybody, it doesn't resonate, but I think creatives have been left in the dark for a long time right? Like from my experience and speaking with creative teams, the main question that I usually hear is like, or the main concern is like, I don't really know the impact of my work. Like they, I'll usually hear, Hey, I, I, I hear it's not working anymore. I ask why not necessarily sure it's top of funnel and we have to do something new. Right? So then for the creative team, a benefit of being able to say like, well, how can I look at this data? So it makes sense. And building those skills out can really empower not only like the decisions they make to develop new creative, but also be able to say like, listen, I'm good at this. I make good work and it resonates quite well, right? And then I think ultimately that management layer always needs a finger on the pulse. So, uh, so I know that what, was- What do you think about this? What do you think about this summary? So just kind of to, to summarize what you're saying, here's the way I understand it. Tell me, tell me if, this, if this makes sense, where basically if you're a really small team and you're kind of just wearing many hats, then you know that you don't actually have the time to be doing everything and there it's a lot more about being smart with your time, focusing on things that have really high ROI, not just from like actually media buying ROI, it's like ROI on your time. Uh, so high, low hanging fruit, high ROI activities, and just kind of stretching the most of your time that way. That's sort of how I think about it on the small end. And when the team is a lot larger, sounds like what you're saying is the biggest goal there is to make sure that the information is moving. So the data is flowing from from team to team so that the context of those learnings is flowing through the organization in a way that doesn't get trapped somewhere and people can make better decisions. Is that like a good way to kind of frame what teams that are on the, on the smaller end and the, and the larger teams might, might want to think about it this way? Very good way. Very good way. Thank you. Nice. I like that. Awesome. Perfect. So now that we've covered a little bit of the introduction to the sprint side of things and the team members involved, I think it's important that we dive into like what sprints actually are now, right? And two major components of sprints, and we'll start with the first one being net new concept wise. So when I'm mentioning a creative sprint and a net new concept, what this is typically related to is what we see here being marketing calendar, times of the year, product launches, sales, and all of those different elements, right? I'm not gonna focus too much time today on our net new concepts because these are larger asks in terms of our output, heavy briefing and research, a lot of execution and a large quantity of creative assets. It's just really important that we determine the key attributes and I'll hold another session specifically on this of like briefing, research analysis and that kind of stuff. But the part that we're gonna spend a bunch of our time on is specifically within sprints on the iteration side of things. 
So this piece is really related to the ongoing and structured approach to performance creative workflow. Um, fancy way of just saying like, how do we set a specific cadence, whatever that would look like to your brand or agency on where we can say, okay, how do we create a light brief, involve the necessary people so we have focused execution. And then we have a low quantity of creative assets, but they're very tailored to what we need. So these are the two approaches. And when we look at it from a, a not even a timeline perspective on just like the, the work required from a briefing and execution standpoint, that's why we do wanna focus on iteration first because there are a lot of easy wins there. Okay, sweet. Uh, at this point now, I think when we talk about creative sprints, I'm going to get into like the nitty gritty in a second here being like, what are the steps in that kind of approach? But before we even determine the steps, I think the first part, it's not even I think, I know the first parts of creative sprints are related to data and findings. Like that's what it's gonna be rooted in. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm specifically gonna use motion. There's no pressure at all to use motion by any means. This is just my preference just because I have it here. But anybody can do this just within their um, pivot tables, downloading data within their Google Data Studio reports and automated grouping and those pieces. And if you have any questions about that, just let me know after the call. But let's start with the first bucket being data before we jump into findings. So the most important thing that I wanna talk about when we're talking about like, how do we view creative performance instead of just like one ad or one audience is making sure that you're grouping data together. So your grouping mechanism can be whatever you want. It can be naming conventions, it can be post IDs, it can be like image hashes from Facebook. As long as you're throwing them together, that's the most important way. And like you can see here that all the data we have is grouped together. So you're looking at it holistically. So that's the first piece before we even look at creative performance is making sure that it's grouped. And then the second piece is related to findings. So when I say findings, what I ultimately mean here is just have an understanding of what you wanna tackle, right? So determine that first next step for you when you jump into it. And one that I like, and I talk to a lot of teams about is the IDA or ADA funnel. So the attention, interest, desire, and action. So I'll go through this super quickly because this is gonna set the stage for the examples that I talk about later. But the first place that I like to focus is specifically on the iterative side. So iteration to level set means making a small change to an existing asset rather than doing net new all the time, right? So what are the metrics that you should care about when you're performing this analysis? The very first thing that you'll wanna care about is ultimately your thumb stop ratios and your click to purchase ratios. For everybody on the call, I know this is stuff that you probably talk about, but just as a quick recap, thumb stop ratios, those are our scroll stoppers. So how good of a job does your creative do get to stop somebody in their scroll and watch the first three seconds of your image um, or three seconds of your video and thumbnail. The click to purchase ratio is ultimately your conversion rate. So with these two metrics in mind, the very first thing that you wanna look out for is the relationship of low thumb stop to high conversion rate. So within my data set that I have here, it's, it's quite simple. And, it, and it's shown, for example, like this, this version here, this Navy version here, so on and so forth. And once you have this and you're like, this is what I wanna tackle, I know I wanna iterate, you're able to then develop a hypothesis. And I promise I have these written out as examples that we'll look at later. But a hypothesis, when we look at data like this, becomes if I'm able to increase my thumb stop ratio, so the engagement of this creative, I'll be able to generate more revenue because I have a nice and high conversion rate. So with that in mind, my ask for the creative team gets super simple. It's literally, let's do one other version that's just a different thumbnail in first three seconds. And let's do a second version that's just a different thumbnail even. And that way everybody's off to the races, but that, that's, that's the specific focus that I had talked about earlier and just making sure you're doing things with intention. Now, so, can I jump in here real quick, Evan, for, to make a point and ask you a question as well? It's like, one of the things that I find really interesting is you know, you're, you're obviously going to get deeper into, you know, what to do with this data and coming up with some hypotheses and some next steps and like creating this like very interesting iterative loop, with, which I think is really fascinating. But one thing that I feel like sometimes because we also we you, you and I think so much about the that iterative side, I feel like we sometimes gloss over the fact of just knowing the data is, is like a, an interesting fuel to conversation for teams where you, know, you, you create a bunch of videos and then just like, whether it's in Slack or whether it's in a team meeting, just the conversation of like, hey, this video had a thumb stop ratio of X. And that was interesting, right? Like the, in, in having that information, even if like before we were even thinking about a next step, 
ha like having the kind of culture where that sort of information is moving and and uh and i think that can fire a lot of teams up because sometimes these things are like culture building too right like when you're when you're creating these things across the team you want people bought in you want people excited and generally if you can find a way to 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 have people just like know what happened is a uh, can be like an energizing force um so i i because I, sometimes you're surprised too right like you'll some there'll be like a video that should, should be very catchy and maybe the first three seconds of that didn't perform too well and so um that's that's a really interesting point for me of just you know it's a huge win just to get the teams understanding what's going on with data obviously evan's going to dive deeper into like you can't leave it hanging there you got to like figure out the next steps but um what do you think about that evan is there, is there value in just that information being understood by uh different stakeholders just to be in, in the loop informed on like what's happening there's in, in my view there's some value in that even I love that you looped in the cultural element, like, like, I love it, right? Because I think a lot of the times we can see that as fluff, but ultimately, that's what's driving things forward. And it also speaks to the empowerment that we mentioned earlier. And empowerment's not only on the creative side, it's on everybody just getting their time back, like Rosa had mentioned before. So yeah, I'm completely aligned. Um, knowledge is power at the end of the day. If we can get people moving quicker, it's always better, right? Um, okay, so now we know the data, then then what? What do we do? What do we do with with some of these uh, some of these findings? Yeah, so with some of these findings, I think the first thing like why I wanted to highlight just know which type of metrics and what that first step might look like for you is just so it's that easy lift. We had talked about smaller teams. It's like what's something what's something in terms of data that I can look at and just say, OK, immediately I can action upon that. Right. So this is the first example that I wanted to show. But I think another thing that I want to show before I dive into exactly like how do we structure this? on an ongoing basis is just making sure that I'm rounding out like the, uh, the attention, interest, desire and action, just the formula there, just because I know it's so important to the, the environment we're in now and it's a hot button topic. So the final thing that I wanted to mention is just outside of videos and why this is so important is because again, more and more you're seeing to being talking about everywhere, but it's landing pages, right? Like we're going to center this conversation mainly around the performance creative side and what that means. But ultimately what we need to take to take into consideration is the experience from creative to then landing page. And how do we identify what exactly is going on there? So the final set of metrics that I just want to put onto everybody's radio, uh, radio, uh, radar in terms of what they should look at is if you're an e-commerce brand, it's going to be CTR outbound clicks because you care about who's going to your website, less about social media pages. Your retargeting will pick that up. But for anyone SaaS in the building or collecting leads, you'll want this to be CTR all because you're probably going to have on-platform um, just forms. So we'll have CTR outbound and compare it to click to purchase ratio. And then with these two metrics, what you're looking to do is you're looking to diagnose if you have a creative issue or a landing page issue. So everybody's keeping this in mind because what we will then look for are relationships of high CTRs, so high engagement, to then low conversion rates on the click to purchase side. Because if we see anything like that, then ultimately on your end, you know that the creative is resonating quite well with the intended audience. They're going to the intended destination. They're just not completing that purchase, right? So how do we create a cohesive story from start to finish of what they experienced in creative and then the landing page? So sorry, Reza, to derail a little bit, but I, I just wanted to, for the people, outline the, the, the most important funnel that everyone's talking about right now. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. Cool. So let me jump back here. So now let's get into some formal steps that can turn into actionable items here, right? So when we talk about the steps to approaching a creative sprint, Reza had mentioned all of them, but I just want to make sure everybody sees it in writing and it's something that they can hold on to. But the first thing that you really want to do is build an initial hypothesis that's rooted in data. So like I said, understand which data metrics you want, you want to look at and then build a hypothesis around it. After that, you're going to make sure that you have your control groups. I'll elaborate that on that in a second. You'll then create your brief and inform the required team members, whether they're creative, um, people who build landing pages, agency, so on and so forth. And of course, you execute and recap. And then when we think about before we like how we actually structure a creative sprint, I think another part of this that I that I get a lot in terms of questions 
is just related to like, what is the ideal cadence, right? Like typically what I've seen, it ranges from seven to 14 to 30 to 45 days typically, right? And what I'll say here is like the first element when we talk about testing, it's very spend dependent. So um, anybody in the room, like you'll probably know based on your spends where you should land. And what I usually see is like a seven to 30 day window. And then from a performance creative creation side, and what I mean there is like the creative team who's creating assets. I typically like to allocate like seven to 14 days. So give them time to after they receive the brief and create the additional assets. And that's what the timeline will always look like. So you're briefing on day one, making sure that you're giving your hypothesis, determine your acquired output. You then allow for the creation time, whether it be iterative or net new focus. You launch, so you're running all of your creatives for that set, whatever it may be. I have a 14 day cadence here. And then you're recapping and prepping. Recapping meaning are we validating our hypothesis and then we're prepping our next creative sprint. So at a high level, that's when we're thinking about those timelines. Uh, I think the best thing now is to talk about what an example of this could look like. So here we go. In this first one here, this is an example of my week one sprint kickoff. When I say week one for everybody on this call, this is just like an arbitrary value, right? Like it could be 14 days, it could be 37 days, it could be whatever you want, right? So in this case, what I've done is, is I've used the example that I just spoke to you all about of thumb stop ratios and conversion rates. So in this, I've developed a hypothesis that increasing thumb stop ratios, but maintaining conversion rates will lead to additional sales. So basically what this is doing, it's making sure that I know the metrics that I need to look at. I then develop a hypothesis against those metrics. So I'm easily taking that first step and then I'm making a miniature brief that's still rooted in data for the creative team and everyone else to digest. So the example that I have in this brief and, and, and mind you, um, I, I made this to fit slides more than to, to actually action upon. So uh, that's one thing to note. But it's the initial asks that you'll always want to include being iterate on the first three seconds for the following videos. You will then also want to mention your dimensions or any other context that your brief does require. And then, of course, then, you're going to have your actual. Yes. Sorry, one question for you. Just just, you know, it, it might be obvious, but just just in case to let's like understand this hypothesis a little bit. Why? Why? Why is it that an increase in thumb stop ratio uh would increase to additional sales like you know for this in uh maybe it's obvious but let's let's just make sure we understand it like what 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 is it about this hypothesis that if that's true would would lead to initial uh, additional sales i can do that so i'm just going to jump back again the motion i think it just for me I, i'm used to it basically is it so that we send more people into that funnel, right? Like people are scrolling past the video, but if we can stop more people based on higher engagement in those first three seconds, we're effectively like increasing the volume of people that go into this funnel that we know has been working. Correct. The primary word is engagement, right? Like ultimately your, your creative is being more engaging with the intended audience from a grouped perspective. So increasing this is, do, is doing exactly what Reza had mentioned. If we have more engagement, we know people who do click are ultimately purchasing. So if we're able to get more engagement, more sales. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. So yeah, like, like I was mentioning on the briefing side of things, everybody has their own techniques. And like I said, I made this just to be, to make the point more than anything, but I've been able to include the ask. You can include any additional details that are required. And then you're providing that key direction rooted in data, right? So I've just provided the examples of the videos that, um, that people will be receiving. So these are my pictures of them, of course. It's just like, these are the, vi the videos uh, that we need updating on. And then for the Scented with Love version, it's simple. The first version, we're gonna update three seconds in thumbnail. Thumbnail, I want it to be sold out consistently. Three seconds, I want add text overlays on top of there. And then the second version is just updating thumbnail. So it's just these simple asks that we can make that it's literally, and this is where it comes into whatever you wanna do, right? Like I think it's if you wanna pull it from a random value prop from your value prop doc, go ahead and do that. If you wanna just think of it on the fly, it fits into this format, perfect. Everybody's expecting it now. So we can go ahead and do that. If you wanna use a different creative's thumbnail because you see it has a nice and high thumb stop ratio, you can also provide that as an example. And that just shows the flexibility, but this format will allow you to make sure everyone's in the loop and therefore execute against that. 
Does that make sense, Reza? Am I capturing everything on that one? It does. And I, I think one other thing too, is that like once teams get into the habit of sharing information with, with one another, I think it would be a win for teams to have some, like you mentioned the term memorialized learnings, which I think is really important where with a lot of these kind of week over week iterations, the more shared knowledge there is as like a baseline, as a context across the team, the more teams, like individual team members will be able to, to come up with ideas and solutions that really hit the mark. So for example, everybody on the creative and the marketing team, there is no reason why they shouldn't know, for example, which, which videos have the highest thumb stop ratios. Like in the last few months, everybody on the team roughly knows that like these, what we did here, here, and here from a, from a thumb stop perspective did really well. And so you have that shared understanding, that shared learning on the team that is like, won't show you an immediate return that day. But if you have that baseline across the team, then when somebody is coming up with, with an iteration, if they, if they have an understanding of what has been working well in the past, then they can use that because the creative process obviously has creativity in it, right? Like you cannot, you cannot remove that and you do not want to remove that. And so if, as long as you have that kind of um, baseline understanding, then I, I feel like it, it, it can lend itself to a lot more, you know, freedom from a creative standpoint, because you know what has been working. And so whether um, you're providing somebody very specific instructions, like what uh, Evan has put out here versus like, hey, we just know that the first three seconds here uh, need to be a lot better. And so the hypothesis is like, I know I need to increase my, my thumb stop ratio here, but hey, creative team, like, you know, you take it and, and think of something new, try something else. And I think if that team knows historically what has been working well, what has not been working well, those kind of things, like you incorporate that into the process and all of a sudden you see people are able to, to start flying on their own because they have that, that shared knowledge. But when the team is shooting in the dark and being like, oh, okay, this first three seconds didn't do well, I wonder why. I wonder what about it was that didn't that didn't do well. Were, were there other ones that are similar to this that did do well or didn't? Um, I think it's really important that as like a backdrop to a lot of these week over week iterations, the more context that is able to flu, flow through the team, the more you'll see that the that the impact of these iterations will will have like a really really positive effect if that shared understanding and learning is uh, is incorporated across the team. Yeah, I'm 100% with you, Reza. And I think like just a springboard off of the two, uh, off of what you mentioned, I just have like two additional points there. So the first part is just like carving out the time and headspace to be able to say, well, like, what are we going to do about that thumb stop ratio, right? So I think that's where that sprint cadence we're talking about now allows you to sit down and say, okay, every 21 days, I can look back and actually give myself the headspace to say what happened here. Right. Like, I think that part's important without it just kind of slipping by the wayside and going back to it randomly, all of that. And then the second part is just internally um, for all of your teams. It's just aligning on like what creative metrics matter to you the most and then training people up. You'll notice in these screenshots that I've added, I've just kept it super simple. Like I'm not giving anyone like more information than they need to overwhelm them. It's just like, how do we train somebody on the things they should care about? Like Reza mentioned, thumb stop being the most important if we're talking videos but they just become familiar with the metrics and then slowly they'll become familiar with next steps. So that's just a little bit of context that I just wanted to add on top of there too. So, so you got your, you got your hypothesis, you have your learning, you've come up with an ask, you have two very specific um, guidance that you're offering to the creative team and very easy to action on should be relatively easy to implement. And then uh, what happens from here? This is where my version of memorialized comes to life. Cause I think memorialized, like it, as I hear you speak is a very uh, like broad term. It could mean something for anybody, right? But in my version, it's like related to the sprints and tests that you're running to be able to say, I did this thing, what happened? Have this learning live on forever, right? So if this is our hypothesis, this now moves into the next step of like validating our hypothesis after we've executed. So this is the recap stage. So you'll see here that I have my week one recap and the first thing that I have is just my validation of hypothesis. So here, what the assumption is, is I'm looking at 
um, my lavender hall hallways creative and the change I made, which produced the second version, so a V2, and produced a V3 option. So you would have noticed earlier in this presentation, and just to make it simple, I'll go back to show everybody, you had noticed that I had mentioned a control group, right? So the control group is now the proper time to give you the definition, is the version that we would be able to create the iteration off of. So when we talked about the hypothesis of increasing thumb stop ratio, but maintaining conversion, my control group became this version right down here, which was the original, meaning that it ran for X amount of days, right? Then the second thing that we wanted to do is be able to say, okay, now version two and version three, let's plot those in addition to what my control group was. And then the final thing that we needed to do before actually analyzing the data is making sure that we align the date ranges with whenever version two and version three went live. Because that part will ensure you're looking as close to apples as apples as possible. And once you get to that stage, you're finally able to say to everyone, did we do a good job or not? So in this case, as a reminder, what we wanted to see from the control group was an increased thumb stop ratio, but maintaining the click to purchase ratio. So we can see in V2 here, we were able to achieve that without any issues. Amazing, pat on the back, let's continue down that iteration path. Whereas with V3, the thumbnail change didn't lead to the same outcome. So click creating like a clickbaity thumbnail wasn't the route that we should lead into. So this is the way that we're thinking about before jumping into week over week, 21 day over 21 day, going one to the other, you wanna give yourself that time to be able to recap what has happened from that previous week. And just to give a little bit of context on workflow, because I know we have brands here, I know we have agencies in the house as well, like this is also a great way to not only speak to your creative team and just get them to say like, listen, you did a great job, or this is where we're at. It's also on the client end or the management end, just to keep everybody in the loop and giving them, again, knowledge is power, the information they need. So maybe I, I like what you said about memorialized and, and your your explanation is is very, very specific. Maybe one way to think about it is like, you know, you have at the high level, there is a set of information that's like, known team-wide that hey this sort of thing works this sort of thing doesn't work right and you have that understanding and that's maybe one layer of memorialized learnings um but it nobody can really explain exactly why or what is it about the change that, that did that or was it like fluke for example like maybe maybe it was some other factor but the level that you're describing is like it's going a little bit deeper it's it's isolating something out so that when you when you memorialize that learning, you can be very specific with with learning. And so if you if you document these and you have a new new team member joining, they have this like wealth of information that they can go back and say, oh, we tried this. We learned this. This now goes into our like bank of information uh, that makes it really easy to, to come up with new ideas. And so I really like that. Because um, we're giving specific type of, of knowledge. Yeah, most definitely. Because like right now we're giving everybody like just framework of how to think about these week over week sprints involving different team members at different stages, all of those different things. But ultimately, you all have the most context on the accounts you work on, right? So if we're looking every 21 days and you have these memorialized sprints and someone asks you like, oh, images didn't go well, or it looks like images worked really well the week of, um, I don't know, February 10th, 2019. And he's just like, oh, that's before iOS changes. You know, and it's just like bringing someone up to speed and being able to give them that context. So all of this stuff will memorialize it. But ultimately what's happening here is that you still have the context to make the decisions that humans need to in these situations. You know what I mean? Very good. To keeping an eye on time, uh, I think, Evan, you probably have a couple more slides, right? And one thing I wanted to mention was if, uh, if people want to start either, if you have any questions, post them in the chat box, but also one way that we've done this in the past that's a little bit more fun is you can you can hit the raise hand button. Hopefully everybody has that. And I can do allow to talk from my end and you can just jump up and uh, and ask your question yourself. And so if if, if uh, folks have questions like that, please just um, hit that raise hand button or dump your questions in the chat box. And that way we'll know how much time to budget for for the questions. But uh, don't hold back. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, when those are, as those are coming through, I think a big thing uh, where, where a lot of time people will ultimately spend is still related to like next step or first step, right? Because ultimately 
um, people on this call and, and we can dive into it further on other sessions like this, but it's just understanding those data relationships. Like the first decision that we made was just saying thumb stop ratios and conversion rates are what we want to tackle, right? So having a laundry list of stuff like that for yourself to look at is always impactful. So I have a bunch of other examples just to show and like get people's juices flowing more than anything. But like another way that you can just start to think about this is for week two, I've said investing more money into image assets will generate more dollars. So essentially what I've done, and I know it's a little bit small, is just I've compared the different um, or creative types ultimately that we have and what we're spending money on versus where we're making money. And if we see images doing well, it's like, cool, that informs our ask and we can make these type of changes. So being able to develop whatever hypothesis you want, there's a laundry list that we can give you and I can go through a couple more as well. But ultimately it's just kind of whatever you wanna tackle. Like that's the best way I describe it. And I know it's a little bit ambiguous, but um, I, think, I think everybody on this call can come up with better things than I can if, uh, if we all put our minds together, right? Yeah, I just I dumped in the chat too. One of the other things, if if somebody if uh, if we don't have questions, one of the things that could be interesting just to maximize uh, learning from everybody here, if there's something of like a win process wise that you may have implemented on your team, stuff like this, stuff that are like small wins that but had a really good impact on your team and on your process, would love for you to come up and tell us about it. I'd love to hear about that, and I'm sure other people. Uh, here would also benefit from that. So if there's anything that you and your team have implemented recently with regards to this problem area that has done well for you, uh, would love would love for you to come up and tell us about it. These things are no fun if they're not interactive. It's got to be at least one person come up. Come on, come on team. On the client side, okay, so Jayesh, uh, Jayesh is our first question here on the client side, tips on pushing our agency partners to engage in this iterative practice for ongoing optimization. So if you're a brand or your client and you want to push your agency partners to engage in this, what, what are some tips or things that you've seen work well there, Evan? Great question, by the way. Awesome. Jay, it's good to see you, man. Um, Ultimately, like with this one, as cheesy it is, it's like the knowledge is power thing, right? So it's just with these hypotheses, and I can send the list out after, it's just understanding what data points to look at, make it a lot easier to have those conversations, right? So if we know we're looking for thumb stop ratios and we see thumb stop ratios down, on the client side, you need to push your agency to say like, why are these down and why are we not doing anything about it? So I think the data piece will really ensure that you're actually able to, to hold them accountable to that. <laughs> awesome, man, awesome. Um, so, so that's the first piece just related to the data, but I think the other side of it as well is just making sure that there's like, um, like accountability measures in place. Cause ultimately you want your agency to test on an ongoing basis and keep you informed. And if you notice that there's a slippage, it's like, you're the client at the end of the day, how do you make sure that you're getting exactly what you need? Um, so I think even talking about the idea of what should we do every couple of weeks, uh, could be a really good initial conversation. Evan, I got a couple more questions. Uh, Carmen, Mike, sorry, I missed them. Uh, I actually wasn't looking in the QA box. I was looking in the chat mostly, but we have a few more questions in the, in the QA box. So I'll just read them to you, Evan. What other variables do you use to make creative decisions and why? Great question. <laughs> Carmen, it's good to see you too. We talked the other day. I think a big thing here is just like, um, for me, I'll always tie it to bottom line. And whether that bottom line is coming from Facebook or coming from GA, coming from a third party attribution software, like it's always tying it to that bottom line. So think, to, think of click to purchase is just ultimately that revenue side. So that's why you'll see me compare things like Thumbstop to that bottom line, CTR to that bottom line, right? But I think another piece of this is just related to like um, CTRs, CPMs. If you're looking at videos, it's like the percentage of watch times. Uh, I like through plays a lot as well. And uh, just looking at your cost per through page to get an idea of retention. Uh, yeah, off the top of my head, I think those are the ones that come to mind. Next question for you. Okay. Uh, no, I think I think that covers it. I think that's a really, I think that's a good uh, that's a good summary. I, I do think it's very much related to the hypothesis first, right? Like thinking about. Um, I, I I really like thinking about it from the standpoint of like, okay, what's 
what's a hypothesis or a question or some something that we have in mind that we think might be true and then the question becomes like okay what what actual data variables can help us find the answer to that sometimes we're, we're lucky and, and the variables are like very easy to find so for example the thumb stop piece is a really simple one even with without looking at the at the kpi of thumb stop ratio one might have this hypothesis that like oh if people are scrolling past my video if we can capture the attention better, then that would be good because you know we know that we have a higher chance to convert them later on. I really like thinking about things from that standpoint, and so it might be related to you know the different influencers that we might work with, or even things like zooming out a little bit, like um, concepts. Concepts are really interesting, like you know unboxing or UGC or other things like that. And so I think anything that is anything that is worthy of being a genuine hypothesis is like is a really good starting point and then the question becomes what variables do i need to try to track down in order to look at and validate and investigate this hypothesis that i have and and that way you know evan mentioned early on the analysis paralysis problem which i think is is real and when you just like swim in data you might have this issue where you actually are just like, wait, what the hell am I looking for? I'm just looking at all these numbers and I lost track of like, like where am I? What am I, what am I, what am I looking to find here? So I, I really like that stepping out, just like thinking about a problem and then going to the data to try to see can I can I find a way to to pin down the 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 insights that might help me prove or disprove this uh, this hypothesis. Um, Another question from uh, from Mark here says, "Where do these creative sprints live? Uh, so in Notion, uh, in in apps, like where where would where would people run these sprints?" Amazing. All right, thanks, Mark. Um, on that end, Asana. Sorry. Yeah, I think I think ultimately it's going to live within the project management tools that are existing within your infrastructure, your client's infrastructure, or like that mutually bound system. Right. So that's where you'll track and complete that project management in terms of uploading your brief and the asks, and therefore it becomes like a solid element there. Um, but for the actual like data output side of things, I think the easiest part, of course, is the motion side of things, but you can just do it in sheets. And I think having sheets with all the important metrics that you have uh, and living there can be the best place for it. And then the last question uh, from Brit, Brit Ellsworth, uh, great question, hot topic. Where do you consolidate all data from platforms and third-party tracking? What do we do? What do we do there, Evan? I love these ones because, you know, <laughs> honestly, I, I don't think anybody has the right answer right now to that one, which makes it tricky, right? But I think the biggest thing is just like the trust in, in determining what your what your bottom line um, like decision making will be. So it's like, am I going to listen to GA and what that tells me and whatever attribution I want to use there? Am I going to listen to um, a different third party software? Am I going to listen to what it says on Shopify, right? So being able to say exactly what's happening there. And then once you know what you're trusting, uh, I think third party attribution softwares can group for you. So just seeing what it does on that front. But then once you've trusted it, it's just a lot of that pivot tabling that I was mentioning. So you're downloading the data from that source. So if it's GA, you're downloading it straight from there. And then you're able, based on those UTMs, to align in UTM or naming convention to bring things together and say, like, cool, consolidate if this, then that. Uh, and then that way you're looking at it based on that source of truth. I hope that helps. I just know this is a little bit of a hard one to answer. I want to I wanna toss one. I think I read on Twitter um, recently a, a different idea posted here, which I, which I found was like an interesting way to think about this, where basically you have the question of, like, what is truth? Right. And then you have the question of what does Facebook think is truth? And that's actually quite an important distinction, because if Facebook thinks something is truth, then that's what's going to be fed into its algorithm to optimize based on. And so like it adds one other layer of complexity here a little bit, but it also helps think about, you know, the data. If we make decisions based on data that is outside of Facebook, there is there is a bit of a risk there too because Facebook isn't Facebook isn't going to be making decisions based on that and so it's going to be optimizing based on the data that it has available to 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 it to the algorithm and so I think when thinking about 
when thinking about optimization and performance, I think it is valuable to try to put different pieces of data together to try to come up to an answer about uh, truth. But that doesn't necessarily mean that if some, if you know, Facebook said something didn't work well, but every other kind of GA and other places said that it, that it did, it doesn't mean necessarily that you double down on that, you see the same results, because as far as Facebook is concerned, that didn't do quite well, right? And so it's, it's, it adds a little bit more complexity, but also I think um, hard to just completely abandon in-platform data because of this purpose too, because that's what Facebook's going to be using for optimization. So I think uh, um, adds... Uh, I, will also, I will also say, because like, I still think the, the source of, and this could be a hot topic, but like the source of truth <laughs> is important to determine what matters yes. to you, right? Because like at yep. the same time, it depends what the issue, like, issue, like in terms of how Facebook's optimizing, like it depends how your campaign structure is and all of those elements, right? Like technically, if you know you've put and I know I'm going deep on this, so anyone um, just on like the creative side, it might not make sense. But if you have five ads within a single ad set, and then within the campaign, you have three other ad set with five ads, and then you're not getting spend to a lot of your creatives. Like ultimately, you might just want to try and game the system and say, pull my ad out that I want to try and put that into its own campaign. You know what I mean? Accepting the overlap within Top of Funnel at least. So there are elements like that that also come into play, which is why this is a tricky answer. Yeah, yeah. Attribution is a it's a black hole. It's a tough one, uh, but uh, but I think everyone's working through it. Any any other questions um, that we can answer in the last from, few minutes? I, I see one oh. from Carol in the chat. Have you ever ran into oh, issues okay. where the client has their creative team in house and they aren't pushing enough oh. performance creative out? It's not a priority for them. And how do you explain the value of sprints, iterative testing to them to get them on board? Uh, so with a question like this, I'm gonna to answer to the best of my ability based on my account management experience at an agency, right? But I think what's also helpful is, uh, I know JS is here, so, so he's on the brand side. Um, his insight would be very, very impactful as well, or anyone else on the brand side willing to jump in. But just to speak to this specific point, I think like starting at the high level and making your way in. So first and foremost is just outlining exactly the situation post iOS 14, creative and landing pages becoming the most important um, element in terms of driving performance. But then I think where you can get wins with your client is just making them understand that you're not asking for the world. It's like, I want to do this iterative thing. And what that means on your creative team's plate is to start off. It just means two iterations on one video that you've already made. And I'm only changing three seconds, right? And your goal there is to get some wins, being able to say like, see, these changes were able to get you more dollars. It was able to generate more engagement that then benefited our retargeting. So it's just that dialogue of making sure that the task and the lift associated with that task is actually easy for the brand instead of a headache where they need to get buy-in. I'll add one thing to that too. I think that's a that's a really great lightweight way to, to get people on board is to make the ask like very simple, almost undeniably simple. Another way too to just build up that buy-in from other people is just start incorporating data into, into the conversation. So even if, for example, you have this like, secret agenda where you want to try to push people towards a more iterative creative process you might start as like the first step just reporting on stuff and telling them hey did you know this and did you know that and did you know this happened did you know that happened and i think once you start incorporating these like insights into your conversations it's almost natural for people to want to like the, the curiosity in in people might be like okay well you know if if this is true then Maybe we should try something, and you have, uh, and you have uh, this idea where you're you're not even suggesting uh, that we should iterate, but you're just kind of showing the data that, like, hey, here's here's some of the things that we found, and maybe that invites people to contribute ideas of like, oh, okay, well, if this is what we're seeing, then maybe that's something we should we should try. So I think starting to incorporate uh, data and insights into your conversations is probably a good way to prepare the groundwork for people to, to want to do more of this creative iterative, iterative testing. And then, yeah, like making it easy and lightweight to do, I think makes it, uh, makes it great. And so with that, we are up on time. Really appreciate everybody uh, joining. I think we'll have some sort of, uh, some sort of survey type question after this, but really would love to hear your thoughts. We want to do a lot more of this and we want to do it based on what you, what you'd like to see more of. And, uh, 
and what uh, what you want to see less of. I think we did get through all the slides, or did we did we not get to them? Evan? I have more that are rooted in hypo in like different hypotheses or hypotheses uh, <laughs> that you can have. So okay. maybe I, I think on maybe that we end, can round it up again, in an email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's the biggest thing. And if any other questions come up, like I, I know myself, um, like feel free to reach out and I got your back. I got your back. So we can go into exactly what type of data relationships you care about and all that stuff. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for attending and be on the lookout for the next one of these that we do uh, sometime soon. Take care. Amazing. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.